Okay, this is big. This is very big. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show, which is always big, right? No, no, just kidding. But it's about vintage gear, vintage preamplifiers from the 60s and 70s. No remote controls, analog rule, digital had yet to appear. It was, a, as they say, a very, very, very different time. <laughs> I put up a picture of one of these uh, on Facebook today, and one of my friends said, knobs and switches. Yeah, in those days, preamplifiers had a lot of knobs and switches and buttons and controls. It, it was, because it was different. People had, were really into tape machines, real to real tape cassettes. Uh, they were always dubbing cassettes. They, they loved tone controls, loudness controls. Uh, everybody had a turntable. Anybody who was an audiophile pretty much had a turntable. So the phono sections were a big deal. And uh, tubes, uh, well, tubes are a big part of two of the three preamplifiers that I'm going to talk about. But today the, the episode is focusing on the Macintosh C22 preamplifier. Which is, a, which is sort of a turning point for Macintosh. It was designed or debuted in 1963. They stopped making them in 1972. But it was the last to hurrah for, for uh, Macintosh at the time. Because after the C22, I think the next model was the C24 and it was solid state. So they hit, they hit the end of the line with the C22. I guess they put everything into it to make it a great, great, design. And you know what? Here we are, uh, if you count from when it was designed and when it came out in 1963, so that's 57 years later. And I will tell you up front, I loved, loved, loved the sound of this preamplifier. But you know, I, and it's not that I'm a huge uh, Macintosh fanboy or anything, far from it. You know, I've reviewed some, I like it, but I wasn't totally on board until I heard this one. So just, just, just letting you know up front, this is really, really, really cool. Now, when I, before I go any further, I have to talk about vintage. And one of the reasons I've hesitated to review, talk about vintage gear before is, well, if it's old, and all of these are 40 plus years old, well, what condition are they in? What am I listening to? How, did, how does it compare to what it sounds like when it was new? Uh, probably not as good as when it was new. I think that's fair to say. And the condition of a specific piece, a specific C22 versus another C22, has it been recapped? Has it been calibrated? What are the tubes in it? Because it's an all tube design. I think it has seven 12AX7s in it more specific information will follow below, but uh, it's got a lot of tubes. Tubes are the sound of the preamp. What condition are the tubes? There's a million variables in terms of what one C22 is going to sound like compared to another. So this can't, in any stretch of the imagination, be a review. This is more of a report about this specific one. And I should say right up front, all three preamps, the Macintosh C22, the Audio Research SP3, a1 and the phase linear 4000 they were all loaned to me by skyfi audio they're in new jersey that's what they do they sell used vintage high-end gear so thanks to fernando at skyfi for making the loan possible so anyway um <clears throat> now this specific c22 has not been restored it's pretty much the way it is and I thought the sound was glorious. Will it sound even more so after it's restored? Because I think it will be when I send it back to uh, SkyFi. But all I can tell you is what I experienced. And what I experienced was pretty darn cool. Macintosh was uh, incorporated in 1949. Uh, and they were based in, in Binghamton, New York. They're still in Binghamton, New York. They make all their stuff there. I've been there to their fact. They really make stuff there. They're not just assembling parts that come from other places. They do a lot of the building in that factory in Binghamton, where I'm sure this C22 that I'm reviewing today was definitely handcrafted then. I'm not a vintage guy, so I wasn't going to bed every night thinking about C22s, but now that I've experienced it up close and in my system, I understand why. So, by the way, my speakers for this review, 
were kind of in a way vintage, they're not old, but they're the Cornwall, Klipsch Cornwall 4s. So they're brand new speakers, but they're based on a design that goes back to, I think, the 1950s. So it's sort of fit to use the Cornwalls in this review. The power amplifier, though, isn't by any stretch vintage. It was, well, two, that was a Pass Labs XA25, Class A25 watt per channel amplifier, or a first watt SIT3, which is, uh, I think, 20 watts a channel into 8 ohms. So they're new, but they also sort of just fit the vibe for this, these three reviews that I'm doing. So this specific C22, I believe, uh, was produced in the late 1960s. Uh, it, it's old, it feels old, but in a good, good way. I love the feel of the controls. They still feel good. They really do. Just turning that volume control, turning the input selectors, they feel right. And, um, but the first thing I have to say about using old electronics is they tend to be noisy, meaning background hiss and little clicks and pops and things. And this preamp certainly exhibited relatively high noise levels of hiss, presumably from the tubes. Again, I can't say, I'm not a technician, but the noise level was higher than a contemporary preamp would be. When, and when you change the input selector, because I, I hooked up a DAC to it, a Manhattan, a MyTech Manhattan 2, and uh, a phono preamp, a Sutherland little local that I'll be reviewing uh, soon, I hope. Uh, when I was switching between the inputs, yeah, I heard pop from coming out of the speakers when I changed from one input to another. It's the way it is. That's kind of the way they were, even when they were new, as I recall. Not that I ever had one of these back in the day. So uh, what else can I tell you in terms of using it and living with it? There's a certain amount of leakage between the inputs. So if I had, let's say, the Manhattan 2 still on playing music, and then I went to change and wanted to play records, I would still hear the sound coming from the Manhattan 2, the music coming from the Manhattan 2, when I was in the phono input selector, when I had selected phono input. So uh, you have to turn off the inputs that you don't use. That was kind of common back in the day that you would hear leaking through the other inputs if they were on when you were playing, let's say, records or the tuner or something, right? So you just got to turn off the ones that you don't use. So the one, one uh, input that kind of struck me was that's unusual was <clears throat> a microphone input. I, and I kind of remember seeing those on really old uh, preamps and receivers even. I'm not sure, I guess people had karaoke or some version of that back in the day, but anyway, microphone inputs were not uncommon. The other, the other input that kind of struck me was tape head. I, you can figure out what that means. You know, it has something to do with tape recorders and listening to the tape head, but again, you don't see that on preamps much further than this, you know, after the early 1960s. The bass and treble controls. Now, there's bass and treble controls, and there's also, it also has a loudness control, which is kind of, um, well, it's like a smiley face, let's put it that way, to, you know, uh, adjustment for tone. When you're listening late at night, it boosts the low end and the high end to some degree. And I actually found that very enjoyable when I listened late at night. I wish tone controls and you know, bass and treble controls and loudness came back into vogue because I actually think they're very useful. So just focusing on the sound, either from records or from digital sources like my MyTech Manhattan 2, the sound was rich. It was bold. It was technicolor. It was fun. As a matter of fact, I think that the, the best way I came up to describe what it does is I could play a contemporary digital recording. That's perfect. A good sounding contemporary digital recording. It would go through the C22 and it would come out the other end sounding like a really nicely produced 1960 recording. <laughs> it just transformed digital into this much more appealing and attractive sound for me. Now, of course, for anybody out there who's still watching this video and you want ultimate in transparency and accuracy and a neutral sound, uh, I don't think you should be buying any vintage products because that's not what you're going to get. You're going to get a, 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 a beautiful version of the music that has little to do with the actual recording itself or not much to do with the recording itself. So if you're into super, if you want transparent, you want accuracy, don't, don't buy this. <laughs> you probably shouldn't buy any Macintosh for that matter. 
So uh, I, I loved it for what it did. And I could imagine the people that buy this product or buy a C22 or any 1960s or 1970s two preamplifiers, this may not be your daily driver. It may be not the thing you listen to every day. It would be kind of like, yeah, I'm in the mood for that. I want to feel that that soft pillow of sound. Now, I'm not. I don't want to imply, by the way, that this is a dull-sounding preamp. It's not dull. It's a matter of fact, it's lively, but it doesn't have the uh, the etched hyper clarity thing going on. That that it's not doing. But it doesn't sound overly mellow. It just sounds juicy, delicious, warmed up. Uh, uh, glowing. <laughs> it just has this this palpability, this musicality that is a joy to listen to. The, what it does for vocals is in a similar vein. It makes vocals sound more natural, more like a human being singing. It sounds, it comes out of the C22 sounding less processed. It sounds more well, musically correct, tonally correct, just more like the real thing. It just does. And it was kind of amazing. I was listening to one of Holly Cole's, well, Holly Cole's Temptation album, it's her all Tom Waits covers record, which I really, really, really like. But I don't think it's a great, it's an okay recording. It's from like a good 20 years ago. But it is digital enough to be slightly annoying to me, especially on high res systems. But running through the C22, no problem. <laughs> Sounded freaking great. Then I played vinyl through the C22. Now I used, uh, a, it's really for moving magnet cartridges. The order font is a moving coil cartridge. The C22 is looking for a moving magnet, right? So I ne it needed more gain. So I used a step up transformer, the only one that I had around, which is an old Supex transformer. And I played a record or two, and I thought, yeah, it, uh, I'm getting the same thing. I, I, to be honest, I, I, I didn't get to spend enough time listening to vinyl on the C22, because after mm, half an hour of playing records on the C22, it, it kind of, well, the right channel just got lower and lower and lower. I mean, it didn't shut off completely. But it just started to drift away into the into the ether, and that sort of was the end of the review. Now, again, if you're going to buy a 45-year-old piece of electronics, it is going to have issues from time to time. It's just the way it is. Now, I checked with Fernando, and he said, because I'm not a customer, I'm just going to use this thing for a little bit. He didn't have it fully checked out or brought up to spec or anything. And if this was bought by a customer, it would have been um, more carefully examined before it went to me. And it did sound great for the first mm, two or three days that I had it on. So um, that sort of cut short. So I can't really give you much more about what the turntable input sounded like, what the phono input sounded like, because I didn't really get a chance to listen that much, except to say, then it was, um, I can't say it was more analog than listening to digital. It just sounded equally as good. I could just leave it there. Um, oh, the other thing I want to say about the overall sound of the C22 is it sounds powerful. It's got, <clears throat> you know, it just has this weight, this drive, this power. You know, people usually attribute power to power amplifiers that they, that they sound powerful. But preamps, can as well. And this preamp absolutely positively had that kind of drive to it that was really fun. And it was also, um, in terms of its rhythm and pace, the way it communicated energy, like just the drive of a band, again, really, really well. Um, and I'm thinking, wait, this is a 50-year-old plus piece of electronics and it's got this much life to it. So uh, I had a blast listening to this thing. I, I, I'm sorry that it was cut off at the uh, end, but you know, hey, if you bought a 50-year-old car, you wouldn't be expecting it to drive every day with, without any problems, right? So anyway, 
This is the first episode of a three-part series of vintage electronics. The next one in line will probably be the Phase Linear 4000, which is a solid state designed by Bob Carver. It came out, I think, in 1972. It's actually a four-channel preamp because quad was a big deal at that point, quadraphonic sound. Uh, and it's got a lot of doodads and knobs and controls and features that are pretty unusual. So that's next in line. And then I'm going to finish off the series with an Audio Research SP3, which is two preamp. Um, so all three are made in the USA, if that matters to you. All are 40 plus years old. And I'm having a blast just digging in with these three preamps. And I hope, <laughs> I hope if you're, if you're thinking about tasting that, about tasting what vintage is, I think preamps more than power amps might be the way in because they kind of put the sound. You can, in other words, I use solid state power amplifiers with all these threes and I, I didn't feel like I was missing out on any of the vintageness of the sound. Okay, so that's it for today. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. Uh, if you dig it, please subscribe uh, to this YouTube channel. If you already have, thank you so much for subscribing. If you think I deserve a thumbs up, uh, please give it to me. If you think it deserves a thumbs down, that's, that's okay too. I recommend that you check out the playlist. There's playlists for speaker reviews and headphone reviews and electronics reviews and music reviews, tons of good stuff. Probably the main thing I would like you to check out is my Patreon, which can be found at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash audiophiliac. If you can't write that down fast enough, uh, no problem. There is a link below to the Patreon. And that's it. My work here is at last complete. Thank you so much for watching, and I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon.